Welcome to Euro Money's Finance is Female, a series of events in which we are examining issues around diversity and gender balance. My name is Lucy Fitzgeorge Parker, and I'm the editor for Sustainable Finance at Euro Money magazine. I'm delighted to be joined today by Cameron Ireland, the CEO of Bordex. Bordex is a company which provides people and relationship intelligence solutions to the financial and professional services communities to help create business development opportunities and provide data analysis to aid thought leadership activities. We also have with us Dominic Sutton, Bordex's Chief Data Officer. Before we start today's discussion, a short disclaimer. This event is for information purposes only. We are not giving investment or transaction advice. All views expressed on this session are those of the participants, not of Euromoney. All comments are public and on the record, and all content is copyright Euromoney Institution Investor 2020. Now we've got that out of the way, uh, Cameron and Dominic, welcome to Finance is Female. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much. So uh, we're talking about gender diversity, and this is something that Bordex has been doing for a very long time. You've been monitoring gender diversity on corporate boards for more than 10 years, and you published your latest global gender diversity report in June. So Cameron, uh, could you tell us a bit about what the key takeaways from that were? Um, in a year of generally bad news, is there some good news on board diversity? Absolutely, thanks Lucy. Yes, so um, one of the interesting things, as, uh, as you mentioned, we, we've been doing this for quite a long time and we have seen that um, the general trend for improving board diversity uh, has continued to increase. Uh, Predominantly, we've always seen it occurring in Europe, but also now globally, we're seeing uh, many other countries uh, improving their overall gender diversity ratio across the board. One of the interesting points and key takeaways for us were that there are a number of different countries that are improving, but the variety of board diversity versus the diversity at the leadership team level, or even within the senior management, can be very, very different uh, within different countries. So an example of that is the UK has um, a very, very good board diversity when you compare it to the United States. But if you turn that around, the United States has a much better uh, gender diversity at a leadership team level. So a number of questions come out and um, we asked those questions within this report it definitely indicated that where there is government influence around uh, gender diversity, helping push the agenda, it has most definitely improved. What I'd like to do is just quickly turn over to Dominic, who was the author of the latest report, to give you a little bit more detail around um, what those key takeaways actually were. Um, well, I'd like to first start with picking up uh, one of the points Cameron made, which I think is really important. And the, as you said you yourself, Lucy, in a year of bad news, it's good to have some high points. And, you know, we did the benchmark against 2014 and pretty well every country in the world showed improvement. Um, you know, so the top country, uh, France, 43% of the boards are now female. Uh, that's up from 32%. Uh, if you go even to the, the laggard, Japan, which unfortunately tends to come at the bottom of a lot of these tables, this year it came out in 9%, um, which isn't great, but that compares to 4% back in 2014. So even in Japan, we're seeing uh, levels doubling. And in fact, it, it's, it's quite a striking thing when you go across the 26 countries that make up this study, that you, know, you are looking at progress right across the board, all countries, all parts of the world, and you know, it, it's, it's a very um, encouraging thing to see this is a global phenomenon. This isn't just concentrated in, let's say, Northwest Europe or the United States. It is, it is something you find everywhere. So you are covering emerging markets in this study as well as the developed market, developing developed world. It's predominantly, I suppose, middle income more than emerging. So Singapore, Hong Kong, Brazil, Russia, uh, Malaysia, South Africa. South Africa actually is in some areas is doing extremely well. Um, Australia, obviously, a more developed market, but again, a country that never seems to quite get to the top of any level, but is always very close to the top. And, and in fact, in some of the follow up reports we are writing and publishing, um, we're finding Australia beginning to come, you know, quite impressive in its performance. 
And then Cameron, you mentioned the question of the difference between board level and leadership roles, sort of not mm -hmm. executive and non-executive roles that women are filling on, on the boards. Can you tell us a bit about um, which countries are doing best overall in terms of the sort of leadership and executive and non-executive roles for women? Yes, certainly. So um, interestingly, if you look at the board, uh, not surprisingly, Europe fills most of the top 10. And um, then when you start to break it down, and if I use the US and the UK as, as the two key comparators here. Um, so the US has achieved 17% um, across the board for gender diversity, uh, whereas uh, the UK is much more significant. We're over the 30% mark. Um, that is totally down to the government agenda that uh, I highlighted a little earlier, where you know there was a, a couple of reviews that were initiated during the course of 2012 through to 2016 and that really started to drive forward the need with British companies to improve their board level diversity. However, when you switch it around and you look at um, the leadership team itself, what you typically find is, well, European countries, yes, some European countries are mandated to have um, a diverse leadership team as much as a board team and so quite quite normally you would see a much better ratio there but the US is the one that is significantly different so in the in the table that we put together um, the US ranks seventh in um, the countries versus uh, the UK which is significantly lower um, and it asks the question, why is that? Is it that um, the US have done a great job of focusing in on the leadership team of companies and helping women develop their journey to get to key roles and responsibilities, whether that be the CEO or member of the C-suite, and then they fall short in getting those individuals across the board? Or is it, um, if you look at the UK, that actually we have done a great job on the, the board side, but we're not doing enough to promote within an organization to get women into senior positions. Those are key questions that obviously BoardX can't answer just yet, but I think they are worth looking at in further detail because that will be the key to help drive forward better gender diversity. And you can use the UK and the US as the comparators because if you then look at a mixture across the world, and as Dominic said, you know we have countries uh, at the bottom, like Japan, who are making great strides on board diversity. And you can then make an assumption really that the lessons learned about what is happening in Europe and what is happening in North America with regards pushing forward um, better diversity in leadership teams in the hope that that then translates into better diversity in boardrooms is the way to go. And those are the lessons that these countries then should be learning and certainly the organisations within those countries. Just to kind of pick up a couple of points Cameron has made there. Um, we, you know, we tend to see a lot of the progress, certainly on board level, on, in the Northwest Europe. Uh, but this is, you know, and we, you know, we associate that quite strongly with the you know, kind of societal and governmental pressure to increase diversity. But we also find that popping up in places like, for example, India. India now has uh, introducing progressively more and more rules about, for example, re about two years ago, they introduced a rule that there must be at least one female member of every major board. Uh, they're now talking about introducing similar rules for people with disabilities. So there, you know, this is a trend that we are seeing pretty widely. Uh, but there's one thing I just like to, you know, unfortunately, not so perhaps good news, but I think it is important to highlight when we look at board diversity. And that is part of our report is that we also split out the boards between executive directors and non-executive directors. And what we find is that, yes, in many countries, including, let's say, France, which is the highest scoring country for board diversity, 43%, when you look at executive directors versus non-executive directors, you find actually that the picture isn't quite so rosy. If we take France again, you know, non-executive directors are 47% female. 
Executive directors are only 8% female. And this is a pattern we tend to find pretty commonly across that where board, whatever the country, whatever the percentage in boards, you know, where we get a given level, it's predominantly progress in non-executive directors. And this is part of the reason why it, it sponsored us, in fact, to write, to carry out our next study, which will be coming out soon, which looks at leadership teams. Um, one of the problems, of course, looking at boards and executive directors is that not every country in the world, um, not every uh, stock market uh, appoints executive directors. Um, some of the big high diversity countries like Norway, Sweden, they actually don't appoint. Or even if you go to the US, and perhaps one of the things that perhaps has artificially depressed the US scores in these tables is that typically the only CEO you would get on a board, uh, the CEO is the only executive director you would get on many US boards. So when we look at leadership teams, then perhaps it's not surprising that we find countries like the US doing that a little bit better to in some areas a lot better when you take a, a much broader section of the, the business community in that sector. Well, we're talking about the split between executive and non-executive directors, but when we look at the sort of women in the leadership roles, so I guess executive directors and also more broadly in leadership teams, what are you also seeing in terms of the sort of roles that women are playing? I mean, is there is there good spread across different sort of roles or does it tend to be concentrated in particular areas still? Shall I take this up? Um... Um, so the, the, I suppose this is quite uh, familiar at the moment because we're, we're, as I say, about to publish a report looking at leadership teams and a large part of that report was we actually took the 15,000 odd roles and we categorized them into eight major disciplines, which would cover the main characters you would expect, like general management, operations and technical, HR, legal, finance, so just to try and get a kind of analytic stretch around those. And what we found is that the 18, 19% of roles which are held by women within the leadership teams are not really evenly distributed. So if we take on average across the 26 countries, about 55% of HR roles are held by women. So women actually tend to dominate. Uh, the next highest level is in um, legal legal services. Again, uh, just to point out a question some, some, like, sometimes I get, this is actually employees of the company. It doesn't include external counsel. And that's at 40%. However, the problem is that if you look at the 55% of HR roles, they only make up typically just under 6% of the roles on among the leadership teams. So actually the impact is only about 3%. If you go to the other side, general management is about 44% of the roles. But women are just under 10% of those. So actually, it's, it's you know, much more skewed. And in fact, we go into some length in the next report, which will be published soon, as I said, where we actually look at the disparities between the various disciplines. And I suppose one way of summarizing it is to say that if you look at HR and legal, which are and no disrespect men, but positions of influence rather than positions of power, that's where you tend to find a lot of women on boards. Whereas when you look at positions of power, like general management or finance, the levels of women being in these positions is much, much lower. I think um, one of the things I would add there is, you know, the continuation of the series that we've been working on, and it, it is based very much on the data that we've been collecting for many years, is, you know, if you look at each country, and then you look at the policy decisions that have been encouraging um, women to move into other roles other than you know the standard so in the UK you know we know there was a very big push to uh, promote engineering and the sciences um, I think that translates also into companies needing to look at their leadership team makeup and say how are we actually promoting women into these roles how are we preparing them to uh, create those opportunities that they can break out of the more traditional route and move into more of the general management, the CEO type roles, or obviously the specialist roles like CFO um, and others, rather than just being happy with, yes, that's fine, you know, we, we, we're achieving our percentage, but it is slightly skewed because it's the same roles, marketing, HR and um, legal. 
So, so I think, perhaps not quite yeah, perhaps not quite such a rosy picture as 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 uh, it seems at first glance. Then yes, I, I think like much of life, it's it's a bit of a mixed picture. <laughs> Um, I, at one point, I always come back to, you know, we talk about, you know, having women in the most senior levels of organizations, executive, non-executive, but really for them to get there, they need to have the right experience. And I suppose a great example of that is the, um, the, the lady who's just been appointed chief executive of City, which is, you know, the first appointment of a major bank. And if you look back at her recent career history, it's very clear that, you know, she didn't just get picked from a, a position and put in, she was being prepared for that. She was being exposed to the skills and disciplines and experiences that made her be able to do the job, to be able to not only prove her ability, which I'm sure was not, uh, not in doubt, but also that she had those positions, that experience, that track record, which enabled her to move right up to the very top of the organization. And I suppose the one thing that really strikes me about this is if we are seeing women being funneled into a narrow set of influence rather than power roles, it, it does concern me that they're not getting that experience, the, the broad experience, particularly in these kind of direct operational and power positions that enables them to move to the top. So obviously, and of course, you know, it, we would like to see much greater diversity within all these disciplines and we've, in all these roles. But also it, it also, it points to the future that if we want to see women continue to progress into the most senior positions, they also have to have the track record and those experiences and skills that they need to be able to move into those positions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's a major challenge, not only in terms of the roles themselves, but also what it implies for the future moving into the top levels across the world. Are there any countries that are doing better on that than others in terms of having women in more power positions as opposed to in influence positions? Um, well, if I just look at, uh, and because this is a female in finance, um, I've actually pulled out some figures on the financial services sector. Now that's not strictly mm -hmm. banking. It also includes things like specialist finance and insurance roles. Um, top country for financial services uh, diversity among leadership teams, actually Norway, uh, where it's 40%. Um, so it's actually even better than the, the board level diversity. Um, then Sweden and um, then our friend Australia. And Australia tends to crop up pretty strongly across the board. And, and in fact, in a, in a kind of a analysis I was trying to do to understand how sectors are um, um, uh, diversity across different ranges uh, linked up what a the, the country that consistently seemed to be outperforming although it's, it's kind of murky because you're comparing so many different things against each other was in fact australia uh, another country that cropped up quite quickly that i didn't expect to be quite honest is south africa which seems to be you know doing quite a bit there and i know for example in if you look at the, the local equivalent of gdpr regulations in south africa uh, gender is included in that um, so there, there is a focus as well on uh, gender diver on gender equality um, also malaysia you know it's not at the top but it is also coming up so it is it is a spread but of course we are finding uh, you know the the Northwest European and the United States, uh, UK, you know, tend to be up there near the top as well. So it's, you know, it, the picture, it, it varies also very much by sector, something else we're just currently uh, working on. Um, so sectors have a big influence, but generally I think, you know, there are some countries um, you are seeing, uh, but other countries um, sadly are not performing. And at the bottom there, again, I'm afraid we find Japan which has a pretty powerless uh, record, I'm afraid, when you look across sectors or you look across um, functions. And how difficult is it to get the sort of data you need to drill down on these um, areas for, say, leadership roles? A board level, I guess, is easier, but for the leadership roles, is that how much of a challenge is it getting reliable and comparable data from all these different markets? Let me take that one, Don. So yes. the, um, the answer to the question, uh, Lucy, if you'd asked us this 15 years ago, it was really hard. You know, we, we learned very quickly that um, information that was in the public domain um, had varying degrees of accuracy. And therefore, the whole BoardX process um, has been built um, around how to validate and triangulate against multiple data sources to 
derive a the level of accuracy that we need so that any report like the global gender diversity report is accurate and also identify where you can typically source this information and i have to say that the team in chennai have become experts now at not only ensuring that the validation of this data is highly accurate but also identifying sources of information that are either equal to regulatory filings, which is one of our primary sources, or from the company's website and understanding how we can ensure that that is as up to date as possible. So we, we try and use technology as much as we can to double check any changes that are coming on corporate websites, um, while at the same time using regulatory filings to form the backbone of our data collection. This is all in the public domain. Where it starts to get trickier is as you start to go down the layers of management and individuals may not be openly um, out in the public domain. And all we do is we extend out our, our collection processes to try and spread that net wide so that we've got multiple sources to fill out someone's profile. And obviously in particular around gender diversity, it's obviously gender, but um, it's trying to verify other pertinent facts that are all within the compliance of GDPR. What we don't do is we don't ever guess. You know, that is something that from day one, Bordex have never tried to guess a piece of information. Um, and we make it very, very clear within the product. Okay, great. Well, we're talking about gender diversity, obviously, because this is the what you what we're talking about your gender diversity report. Clearly, gender has been under the spotlight for a while when it comes to board representation. Obviously, this year, we have seen an increasing focus on racial and ethnic diversity when it comes to boards and employees more generally. Do you think that the what you've learned about companies and, and uh, jurisdictions on the gender side, do you think that is there's there's a utility in that for sort of, for looking at companies' approach to diversity mm. more generally? Do you think there's an overlap between companies' willingness to promote women and their willingness to promote diversity more broadly? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that we have seen is you know, quite rightly, there has been a key focus this year on trying to change racial and ethnic uh, diversity. But I always ask the question, and certainly as Dominic and I have been carrying out um, various different paths of analysis around this, the question is, the lessons that some organisations and countries have learned around gender diversity, i.e. getting government backing, getting a groundswell of momentum around putting into place policies and practices that will help encourage change shouldn't just apply to gender diversity. They should apply across the board. Any type of diversity or uh, inclusion that is being discussed should have those same overall policies and frameworks implemented. Maybe slightly different um, in terms of the particular topic, maybe, but also, um, particularly if you look at uh, sort of the ethnicity side, very regional focused as well, because you can't apply the same rule across the whole world. But what you absolutely can do is apply that framework that is, let's make sure that we are creating the opportunities for the right person who has been given that opportunity to get the right experience, the right qualifications, and their barriers to entry, if you like, are being removed, while at the same time, there is increased transparency and recognition that the lessons learned around trying to get gender diversity up to a reasonable uh, level is applied to other areas. There's no good saying, well, great, we've got to 30% on gender diversity, that's job done, because it just isn't. And exactly the same applies to racial and ethnic diversity and other areas. You know, it's an ongoing thing. It has to evolve. And therefore, those lessons learned need to be applied across the board. Um, one final question before we finish. You, as I say, have been pr pr producing, you've been monitoring gender diversity on corporate boards for more than 10 years. The response to that, I mean, are you now uh, over that period? Uh, how have you seen the response to the to what your to your work and and from 
different sort of stakeholder groups though and is that something you would it, again is it would be nice to think there's been a sort of steady progress mm. of, of interest in that is that the case well that's a great question actually lucy um the the biggest thing that we have seen and i i firmly believe and this is my personal opinion but i firmly believe that this is caused by what has been going on this year is that we saw a momentum building up in various different countries where you know we would be the provider of data to various different organizations whether they be not-for-profits or public and private organizations that were carrying out their own thought leadership activities but what we've seen this year and certainly from january onwards there has been a marked increase where we have obviously been participating and, and pushing out our own thought leadership around the subject but the collaboration between organizations has increased markedly and i include bordex within that in terms of our clients and uh, not-for-profits that we have been talking to around this subject but also when i talk to our clients the partnerships that they are creating you know, i had a conversation just yesterday with um, a major investment bank that they are actively collaborating with a number of key organizations in the US to promote diversity across the board. So they're not looking at any particular theme, they're looking at how it can be improved across the board and what they as a bank can do. So what measures that they are doing internally, but also externally, how do they advise their clients and how do they become thought leaders in what is a very, very important topic. And for me, this is um, something that is incredibly important because if we don't collaborate and we don't work together, then change won't happen. And, and it can't just be one organization. Well, that's, I think we're coming to the end and that sounds like we have some good news to finish on, which is great. So I guess overall, something of a mixed picture, but definitely uh, an increase in interest, an increase in collaboration and an increase in board participation. So, and, and even Japan is pulling itself up. So then there is a, there is a good, uh, definitely things to be positive about. Well, um, fantastic. Well, uh, unfortunately that is all we have time for today. Um, Cameron and Dominic, thank, thank you very much for your input. It's great to have you with us. Thanks very much, Lucy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you also to our viewers. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. In the meantime, take care, stay safe, and goodbye from your money. <laughs>